Welcome to Thorpe Abbott, home of the 100th Bomb Group. They say today you can still hear the airmen moving about the airfield as they did back in World War II. This was the home of my grandfather, Joseph Alfred Carty, from February 1944 to August 1944. The B-17s of the 100th Bomb Group, adorned with the square D on the tail, are famously known for flying some of the most dangerous missions ever attempted. 75% of all airmen fail to complete their required number of missions. The 100th shared some of the highest casualty rates of the war and earned the lasting reputation as the Bloody 100th. Perhaps this is why my grandfather hardly ever spoke of his time over in England. For the past year, I pulled down his military records from the attic and through his pages would learn one of the most amazing stories of our lifetime. But in order to convey his experiences accurately, I must start at the beginning. Joseph Carty was born on October 7, 1920, in New York City, New York. Growing up as a young boy in the big city, Joe led an adventurous life. At a young age, Joe was a choir boy at a distant Catholic church and would oftentimes have to ride the subway alone to service. Before the war started in 1941, Joe would spend the summer days going to the library and the nights playing poker. By profession, Joe was a teletype operator and handled and decoded cables and wires, both foreign and domestic. He was 21 years old, and he'd school you in a game of tennis if you weren't careful. Military service was not a thought in Joe's mind before Pearl Harbor, but that would all change.
Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. It is the first and only time Hitler actually declares war on another nation. The wars in Europe and Asia now merge into a single gigantic world war, the largest war in history. In the month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army's 8th Air Force is established in Savannah, Georgia. It has seven men and no planes. Less than a year later, it is tasked with defeating the most powerful air force in the world, the German Luftwaffe. 26,000 8th Air Force men will die, more than the U.S. Marines lost in all of World War II. Viewer discretion is advised. There's a seat on that flying fortress for an adventurous young man. A healthy and patriotic young man, anxious and willing to learn to pilot a ship, operate a bomb site, or plot a mission over enemy territory. Young men of 17 to 26 years of age are needed. If you are 17, enlist in the Air Corps Reserve. Men between the ages of 18 and 26 can qualify for immediate training as aviation cadets. Let's face it, fellas, the opportunity of a lifetime is knocking at your door. The chance to learn to fly or navigate the hottest and heaviest jobs on wings or drop the hottest and heaviest bombs without them. No, this is not the interior of a birdcage. And the man you see obviously is not a bird. But he does lay eggs. He's training to become a bombardier, the boy who drops these beauties where they do the most good. Complete information regarding these enlistments can be had at the box office of this theater or at number 607 Custom House. Become a member of the Army Air Corps and take to the skies for a flying punch at the Axis. Joe Carty enlisted in the Army Air Corps on April 14, 1942. He was soon off to training in San Antonio, Texas as an aviation cadet, which would carry on through August 1942. Joe had no idea what the future had in store for him, but the glory and glamour of the Army Air Corps pulled him in. Of all the assignments a serviceman might find himself undertaking during World War II, flying seemed to offer the greatest promise of glory. The world's air forces were relatively new and elite. Aviation was the wave of the future, and new aircraft were built that employed equipment and designs that were on the cutting edge of technology. Many strategists even predicted that air power would be the decisive factor in the waging of modern warfare. By February of 1943, the 8th Air Force has been launching primarily short, shallow missions for just six months. Already, nearly two-thirds of their airmen have been killed, wounded, or captured. But with all of continental Europe under Hitler's control, Allied Air Forces are the only military branch capable of striking inside his heavily defended walls. If they are to prepare the way for D-Day, 
8th Air Force commanders have no choice but to replenish their exhausted force and continue the air war. The only question is can they keep their men alive long enough to succeed? Joseph Carty originally had his sights on becoming a pilot, but this New York City boy had never even driven a car before. The brass had other plans for him and said, No, sir, we're going to make you a bombardier. Shake hands with Mr. B-17 and a few of his big brothers. Now watch out now, he's tough. Those four motors roaring through the sky like a thunderstorm, they can't fool with them. American workmen, the finest master mechanics in the world, put those motors together. Made them live, made them breathe, made them roar. Yes, sir, a whole army of workmen, designers, engineers, and just plain guys who wanted to do something for their country. They put that B-17 together. A few thousand of these babies will win this war for us. And a few thousand guys like you in there flying them. And remember, we said something about a team. Well, nine men are inside that plane, each with an important job to do. So let's go in and take a look around. Let's meet the team. Yes, sir, nine fellas like yourself working together as closely coordinated as a precision watch. Now get this straight. The pilot is not the most important fellow inside this plane. All nine members of the crew are equally important. For example, the pilot and the co-pilot can take the plane off the ground and set it back down again, but where would they be without the navigator? Now meet him. He's the gentleman sitting right there with his pencils and calculators. He's responsible for getting the giant bomber to its destination and back again. Now you might like his job. Now this fellow's a second lieutenant draws $245 each month. And although he was good at mathematics, he didn't graduate from college. But he learned that the Air Forces could use his talents. And now he's a necessary part of the team. And now let's go up into the nose of Mr. B-17 and meet somebody who has an important job in that department. This is the bombardier, the boy who doesn't miss. You see, flying the plane is wasted motion unless this lad hits the target on the noggin. The finest pilots in the Air Force would be behind the eight ball if the bombardier couldn't hit straight. And he's a full-fledged commission officer, too, wears his wings, draws the same pay as the pilot or the co-pilot. Now, back in the main body of the plane, we've got some more important positions. This fellow is the number one engineer. He keeps the motors turning and the thousands of working parts all through the bomber inspected and in repair. And then comes the radio operator, who keeps the bomber in constant communication with its home base. And the photographer, who keeps a photographic record of what takes place on the Earth below while the bomber's on its mission. He's sort of an official scorekeeper, checking up for future reference. Now, the remaining members of the flight crew are number two engineer and number two radio man. So you see, being in the Air Forces isn't all piloting or all navigating or all bombardering, it's teamwork. And each member of the team is just as important as the next one. At last, classification day arrives. Look at those anxious faces. You will soon know, misters. What does the folder say? Preference, bombardier. Rating, bombardier, eight. Good work, mister. Here's a lad who has done a job. He wanted to be a bombardier. His highest rating is for bombardier. That means he will get his preference. Keep on the beam, fellow, and you'll be dropping them on Tokyo. Reflexes, your mentality, your score in these classification tests, we find that you were actually born to be a bombardier. You mean, sir, 
I might really get a chance to drop some bombs on Tokyo or Berlin. That's what the Air Forces mean, mister. And they mean it. I'll put everything into it. Don't worry about that, sir. Can I sign the acceptance now, sir? What do you know? The pilot only chauffeurs the ship in this man's army. He works for me. Well, I'm going to be a hell of a bombardier. I mean, I'm going to be a hell of a bombardier, sir. Breezy Saturday evening on March 6, 1943, when Minnie Ruth Boyd attended a dance for a group of local bombardiers at the Rice Hotel in Houston, Texas. Little did she know the man of her dreams would walk into her life. night was one on the dance floor, and the rest was sealed under the stars. Now on this problem, you'll see that with a no-wind condition, airspeed 240, altitude 10,000 feet, and you have eliminated all personal error by killing your drift and making all the necessary arbitrary corrections, you'll hit your target. This is the bomb release line. You will notice under these conditions the path of the bomb through the air, known as the bomb's trajectory, is directly under the ship, but the point of impact will be trail distance behind the ship. With a crosswind, the ship would be upwind from the target. This distance upwind is known as cross trail. Any questions, misters? All right, that finishes the classroom work. For those of you who pass your examinations tomorrow, there'll be no more ground school for a half a day. Next week, you'll all start flying. But only 12 feet off the ground, on the bomb trainer. The purpose of the bombing trainer is to familiarize students with operations of bomb sight, methods of solving the bombing problem without going into the air. Motion of the trainer across the floor simulates the airplane in flight. The four-wheel, electrically driven box-like affair on which the target is placed simulates wind. The bomb side is mounted on the trainer and data is set by the bombardier. The speed of the trainer to target simulates ground speed. The bomb used on the trainer is an electrically operated plumb bomb, dropped at the proper instant to hit the moving target. Bombs away. Bingo! How high is this supposed to be, sir? 8,000 feet. Oh. Bombs away! Nine degrees left drift. <laughs> a 
And here's where the U.S. Army trains some of those flyers. Ground school for bombardiers. On rolling platforms equipped with practice bomb sites, they learn the secrets of expert marksmanship, study the outlines of potential targets. Now they're ready to take real bombs aloft for an actual test. Student pilots at the controls, student bombardiers on the alert. Their objective, outline of a city, drawn to scale. Down go the bombs, sped to their target by the finest bomb site in the world. Again they let go. No command needed now. This is the bombardier's big moment. Sample of United Nations air power in action on the battlefronts of the world. doing here? Well, we're learning to drop bombs with this new bomb site. We couldn't learn to fly a plane, but we can still ride in one. You ain't kidding. Keep your eye on that target out there, and I'll show you how to drop an egg into a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. Okay. <laughs> then, in the shadow of the greatest bombing plane in the world today, the Flying Fortress, the Army Air Corps is awarded the traditional and honorable symbol of an Army Birdman. He gets his wings. Well, it was a great pleasure to present you with these wings. Wings. This comes as the most thrilling moment in the life of a man who would fly. Conquerors of another world, high aloft. These are no longer men of the earth, but appointed at this moment, rulers of the sky. Yes, it's a long hop from Dodo to Army Birdman, but the young men of America, tens of thousands of them, are making it every day. All working for the same guy, Uncle Sam. All partners in this great business of flying for the Army. All hail to these mighty birds of the Army Air Corps and to the men who fly them. Wings of steel, watchful sentinels in the sky, standing forever guardians of our Bill of Rights. <laughs> targets in southern Germany. Large forces of American bombers were out again today, pounding Europe into shape for invasion. Now American planes of the 8th Air Force have played a great role. The Red Army has captured seven settlements in the Smolensk area. American planes have battered at Jap bases through... Another command performance for that lovely sweater girl, Judy Garland. From the sounds of the news reports, this war might be over before I even get into it. According to this article called, I Saw Regensburg Destroyed, the 8th Air Force over in England just knocked out 30% of Germany's fighter production by hitting one city. Damn, that is a heck of a lot. It sounds like we might be training for nothing. Although right now, all we're really doing is just kind of killing time. In early August, Minnie Ruth traveled to Moses Lake, Washington to marry Joseph Carty. However, the wedding had to be postponed. Instead, 
Cardi would go AWOL from his base for the next three days so he could spend the remaining time with his fiancée. For his actions, Cardi received his punishment under the 104th Article of War for being absent without proper leave from his post. The punishment? Forfeit $75 of his monthly pay for one month. Cardi paid his fine and proudly declared the fee the best $75 I'd ever spent. lips of yours caress mine just to have you by my side would leave me starry eyes star eyes lonely eyes you put a dream in eyes that only you're supreme in don't you know it's just for you They sparkle as they do Though the stars aren't real I know they show how much I care Tell me how it makes you feel As Joe Cardi's training is coming to a close, pilot Randall Chadwick has formed the crew he will fly with over the skies of Europe. Before shipping out, the men have some final business to attend to at their new base at Kearney, Nebraska. Soldiers and citizens came together at the Kearney Army Airfield. They were all fresh out of training. Next step is combat. So they had a number of things they needed to do. Uh, they might write wills. They might buy life insurance. They might. Uh, get their teeth fixed, get their shots. And another thing that was important that happened during processing was that the people at Carney that were doing the processing would try to weed out the incompetents who had somehow gotten through the training and gotten to that point, at which time they were yanked out of the Air Forces and put into the infantry. It was a, an important base. Uh, the rest of the, of the air bases in Nebraska were all operated under Carney as the main base. The shacks that they had put up out there for us to live in was about next to nothing. Then they, then they had the guts to feed us with that food out there. Every other spoonful of was sand. Among the ways the Carney soldiers stayed entertained, the most popular were easily the dances. Dances were an almost nightly event with big name acts regularly coming to the base or to clubs in the surrounding area. We had Harry James and we had uh, Tommy Dorsey. And then they had big name bands come in there because they were going across country. And they'd make that stop and have a, uh, pick up a few dollars and then keep on going. The biggest problem had to do with turning a couple of thousand testosterone-laden young men loose in the community. And the uh, parents were justifiably worried about what, what could result. Especially for the airmen that were passing through. It was the last real impression of America that they got before they left. Because again, when they left here, they went straight overseas. They didn't sit in Maine for two weeks waiting to go. The people in the community went out of their way to try to make them feel welcome. On December 29, 1943, Cardi and his crew receive orders to ship out overseas. After spending nearly a month at the 8th Air Force Replacement Depot in England, John Gibbons, Frank Bushmeyer, Joe Cardi and his crew are all assigned to the dreaded 100th Bomb Group, 350th Bomb Squadron, stationed at Thorpe Abbott. After arriving on base on February 24th, Joe Cardi learns the 100th is embroiled in a merciless battle over Germany in an operation known as Big Week. Joe Cardi's baptism of fire would come soon enough.
It's hard not to think about the eight other guys who slept in this bed in the last four months. All are dead now, or in a POW camp somewhere. I think that damn CEO back in the state said we were nothing but a bunch of screw-ups. God, I wish I could see his face now. Now that we're over here, all we can talk about is finally taking it to the Germans. No one likes to show it, but of course all us guys are a little on edge. We haven't even fired any bullets yet. Other than training. On our final practice run, everyone's wondering what it'll be like to actually fly into Nazi territory. My buddy Griffith, he says he heard that if the Germans shoot your plane up and you have to bail out, the Krauts will blow holes through your chutes. Shoot it up so good you won't even have a chance of making it to the ground alive. But what the hell, I tell them. I'm not so worried about the Germans. I figure we can handle anything the Nazis throw our way. It's gonna be one hell of a ride, though, that's for sure. Being the bombardier is an honor. I mean, the whole point in going out is to hit the target. And with these Norden bomb sites, that is definitely not a problem. Hell, we can drop a couple tons straight into a pickle barrel. They're so damn precise. Like Armanini, U.S. Army Air Force commanders are enamored with their high-tech weapon. By the end of big week, 97 B-17s have failed to return. Countless others crash land in the English countryside, where reporter Andy Rooney surveys the carnage. It's difficult to get accurate stats on our losses. No one is interested in letting the Germans know how effective their flak and fighters are. But looking around, at so many smashed and damaged bombers, we all know. Despite the tremendous losses, American fighters and air gunners destroy more than one third of the attacking Luftwaffe, causing the 8th Air Force commanders to consider Big Week a success they finally feel they have found an effective method for destroying the Luftwaffe. The most savage battle is yet to come. Three o'clock in the morning. All over England at this exact moment, American air crews are being roused from their sleep. 
Okay, fellas, roll out. We have a mission this morning. Rex in half an hour. Captain Kirk, Captain Thompson, Lieutenant Buska, Ackerson, Alloway, and Hawker scheduled to fly. We'll snap it up. Three o'clock. This is a hell of a time to get a man out of bed. All right, you dodos, let's go. This is it. Okay, fellas, let's go. Come on, Swifty, get it out. Let's go. Go, you guys. Hit the deck. Breakfast at four, breathing at five. Let's go. Through the cold of the English early morning, the combat crews go to their mess. They have no idea where they're going yet, but they know they'll be taking off in about four hours. How do you figure those jerrys will be today? What do you think, Doc? They'll be shooting at us. Sometimes I don't think those jerrys got proper respect for us. Well, what do you expect, Buster, the way you shoot? Jerry, look who's talking. You couldn't hit a cow in the flank with a bow feather. Yeah, but how about those two jerrys I slapped down over Swainford? I'll tell you what happened there. They heard that I was on a tail guns and they fainted from fright, that's all. And so it goes. The 4,000 men who will go on this mission all know it will be a rugged deal. For some of them, it's their first mission. Others are veterans of many. Now, at all the groups in the bomber command, the air crews are assembling in the briefing rooms to learn the target for today. the hundredth, the operations briefing is completed. Here in a few minutes, the nature, locale, and route of today's mission will be made known to the men who fly it. Remind you too much the importance of this target. If it is successfully destroyed, it will have a very serious effect on Germany's aircraft production. Lights, please. The main briefing over, the pilots, navigators, bombardiers, radio operators, gunners, receive separate specialized briefings. These briefings are very technical and very thorough, and are held so that every member of the combat crew will understand exactly what he can expect and what is expected of him. Any lack of thoroughness here might very well result in the failure of a mission. It's getting on to the time when the combat crews go to their planes. Here they are in the crew room, putting on their flying clothes. Clothes and equipment especially constructed to ward off the intense sub-zero cold which they will encounter so shortly. All air crew members receive escape kits containing equipment that will help them get back to safety if they are forced down in Germany or in occupied territory. The pilots, co-pilots, navigators and bombardiers are also issued battle folders containing the maps which will be of such vital importance to them in the prosecution of the mission. The men turn in all personal papers and valuables which might serve to give the enemy information in case of capture. Some of the crew members turn to their chaplain, whose ministrations are always available to the men of the bomber bases. Thank you.
So changeable is the weather in the European theater that sometimes widely varying conditions will be found on fields only a few miles from each other. briefing of all, the final intimate conference around each airplane as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Crew members have ceased to exist as individuals. They are now 10-men teams, and on the excellence of their teamwork will depend the success of the operation. of 20-odd fields of the 8th Air Force, more than 400 forts and liberators, with their 4,000 crew members, taxi for the takeoff. Continuing to circle the field, the squadrons then go to 2,000 feet, where the group assembly takes place. This accomplished, 
the group now moves on to the combat wing assembly point. Here is how the group stacks up from the side. The group has a depth of 850 feet. This is how the group looks from above. In the lead squadron, the second element is flown with the nose of the leader slightly behind and to the right of the right wing aircraft, first element. The lead plane of the high squadron flies even with the lead plane, second element, lead squadron. The second element of the high squadron flies with the leader's nose just behind and to the left of the left wing aircraft, first element. Here is the group as an enemy fighter pilot sees it from head on. The first element of the lead squadron is stacked high left and low right. The first element of the low squadron is stacked high right and low left. By utilizing to fullest advantage the field of fire of each gun in the formation. Again, it is proved to be the most maneuverable formation from which to execute the primary and all important purpose of the mission. The dropping of the bomb loads on a precise target. Obviously, it would be desirable to stack as many bombing planes as possible in one defensive formation. However, it has been found that the largest practical defensive formation is the combat wing of three groups. Any formation of aircraft larger than this becomes unwieldy. This force has a depth of 3,000 feet. The nose of the lead aircraft of the low group is aligned with the tail and slightly to the left of the rearmost aircraft of the lead element, lead squadron, lead group. The nose of the lead aircraft of the high group is aligned with the tail of the rearmost aircraft of the lead element, lead squadron, lead group. The combat wing having been assembled, they now move on to make rendezvous with the rest of the task force. In this case, another combat wing. there has been only some light and inaccurate flak at the coastline. Some flak guns have opened up on us. Thank you. 
merely defend themselves against enemy fighter attack so that they can destroy their target and bring their crews back safely to their home bases. An anxious moment comes now for the lead navigator and bombardier. The formation is approaching the initial point. That is the point where the wing will turn off and make its bombing run on the target. Upon proper navigation to this point may rest the success of the entire mission. Pilot to left, waste gunner. We're over the IP. Release flares. Waste gunner to pilot. Roger. Once the combat wing has reached the IP, it breaks up into three component groups, for the wing formation is too unwieldy for a unit bombing operation. The most critical defensive period in the mission has begun. The wing, to accomplish most efficiently its primary purpose, the bombing of the target, has sacrificed its mutual defensive firepower, and the groups are thrown on their own. Now the crucial moment is almost here, the moment around which the entire mission revolves. open, the group is committed to its attack. No evasive action may be taken until the bombs are away. And at this time, the formation is most vulnerable to attack, both from flak and enemy fighters. At the fields, it's getting on towards the most nervous of all times, the estimated time of return. Everyone who stays behind sweats out this period at the end of each mission. Here at the control tower, at the dispersal areas, at the Red Cross, at the officers' club, everywhere on the field, the one thing paramount in everyone's mind is that the group is due back. to attack the target. How many have returned? 
One, two, three, four, five, fifteen, sixteen. Seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen dispatched, eighteen returned. Twenty-three dispatched. Twenty-three returned. However, there are other groups which weren't so fortunate. Eighteen dispatched, seventeen returned. Twenty dispatched, nineteen returned. Twenty dispatched, fourteen returned. Nineteen dispatched, eighteen returned. Twenty dispatched, ten returned. Eighteen dispatched, eight returned. Flares dropped from aircraft signal the presence of wounded aboard. These airplanes are given priority in landing. But their job isn't over yet. Before they can go to their billets for a well-earned rest, they must first undergo one of the most important phases of any mission, interrogation. It is highly important to question the crews at the first possible moment after the mission, while their impressions and memories are still fresh. FW-190s, mostly yellow noses, some white noses. No red nose. No, I didn't see that. Boy, those yellow little boys really come in close, don't they? Did you see that one come right on our left wing? Yeah. I saw a 109 with black and white diagonal markings under the wings. Black and white. Uh -huh. I had white nose. All right. Yeah. Getting back to those rockets, I believe that Jerry can reload his rocket guns from inside the ship. I think he can. That would be my guess, too. I saw at least nine bursts from rocket guns on one ME-210. Nine bursts, sorry. What about planes? Uh, I knocked down two. They were making attacks about five o'clock level. Yeah, I saw them. One of them blew up in the air, and the other one went down in flames. The pilot of the second one bailed out. That was at 11.44. We were right over the IP. Were any other guns firing at these planes? No, sir. These were my babies. Any more? Yes, sir. I got one destroyed and one prowled. <laughs> I knocked a 210 down right over the target. The plane exploded in the air. I got a burst of a 110, and it started down in flames. I couldn't see whether it went all the way down or not. We were under constant attack. The back of the Luftwaffe was broken. Now the B-17 crews could turn their attention to the most perilous bombing mission of them all, Berlin. Hermann Goering, commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, had claimed that enemy bombs would never fall on Berlin, and he had good reason to believe it. As Hitler's capital and the heart of the Nazi war machine, Berlin was the most heavily defended city in all of Fortress Europe. It was ringed by tens of thousands of lethal 88mm anti-aircraft guns and fighters. But by early 1944, production of new fighters had all but dried up. 
Now, the US Army Air Force concentrated on destroying the remnants of the Luftwaffe. By committing to daylight bombing raids over Berlin, the US 8th Air Force would face down the Luftwaffe in the skies above the Reich's capital. It would be a decisive battle, and a bloody one. But if the propaganda value of hitting the German capital in broad daylight was enormous, so were the risks. And the crews of the B-17s knew that they would be the targets of highly trained German fighter pilots. The sun's just come up, and we're already rushing around, getting ready. Seems a little crazy, but I'm actually kind of excited. I think we're all kind of excited. Right as we're about to take off, I see Griffith getting into his plane. I wished him good luck, and he said, I'll see you at the bar. I don't think either of us can really believe it. All the training is finally over. We're really going to hit Germany. As Armanini and the rest of the 263 bombers circle into formation, the airmen face their first enemy. At 12,000 feet, the air is dangerously thin, and the B-17s are not pressurized. Men must rely on oxygen masks to breathe. Inhaling the thin air can lead to brain damage, or even death. At 25,000 feet, the forts reach their cruising altitude. Temperatures drop as low as 50 below zero. Exposed skin freezes to metal on contact. Saliva or vomit turns to ice, clogging oxygen tubes and suffocating men. For the airmen, these are routine conditions.
My hands are shaking just trying to hold formation. I mean, Jesus, Berlin? Even the most experienced guys looked terrified when command said this is where we were heading. Second Lieutenant John Gibbons has been assigned as a replacement B-17 pilot with the 100th Bombardment Group. Just weeks after arriving in England, he is already leading his crew into battle as part of a 15-mile-long parade of nearly 700 American bombers and fighters. D-Day is now less than three months away, and U.S. Army Air Commanders are desperate to bait and kill far more German fighters. To do this, they are attacking the one place Hitler will stop at nothing to defend, the German capital of Berlin. With Hitler himself bunkered in the city, it is the most dangerous mission yet attempted. Nearly 750 anti-aircraft gun emplacements surround Berlin. And more than 70% of the Luftwaffe fighters are stationed within combat range along the way. The bomber's route is intentionally designed to create a 400-mile-long battlefield, along which they hope to attract and destroy as many German fighters as possible. This is it. Time to focus straight ahead and get my crew through to the other side. fighter left in the Luftwaffe is opening up on us. There's not much we can do but take it. On a bombing mission over Berlin, Bert Stiles and his squadron of B-17s are ambushed by the Luftwaffe. The weight of the flying fortress and its relatively slow cruising speed make evasive maneuvers impossible. There is nothing the crewmen can do except hold formation and wait for the help of their P-51 escorts. One crew gone. I feel trapped, a target in a flying coffin. Damn, that's close. For the past two hours, German ground defenses have been tracking the B-17s by way of a new technology, radar. Luftwaffe flak gunners prepare to fire shrapnel-filled projectiles set to explode at the bomber's altitude and rip the planes, as well as the airmen, to shreds. Spotters on the ground already have them in their sights. As they close in on Berlin, more than 10,000 Luftwaffe gunners prepare to unleash the most heavily concentrated flak barrage the American airmen have ever seen. The fighters will not venture into the deadly flak field. 
But Gibbons and the bombers have no choice. To hit their targets, they must head directly over Berlin. We can already smell the cordite from the flak through our oxygen masks. God, my stomach's starting to churn. This is Berlin, for God's sake. They're gonna throw everything they got at us. But no matter what, we're hitting Hitler's town. And we're gonna drop our bombs right on that Nazi bastard's head. I can hear distress calls coming in from other bombers. The pilot's saying they've been hit. My God, just a couple hours ago, we were sitting on the tarmac wondering about what the Germans would do to us. Well, now we know. They'll kill you. They'll kill you deader than hell. The entire world is on fire. Like the whole thing could just rise up and consume us at any moment. There's nothing I can do except hold steady and pray I'll get through. Pray I'll see my family one more time. Pray I'll still be around when Dorothy receives that letter. Bomber boys, their primary mission is not to hit targets, but to attract the Luftwaffe. And the primary mission of the fighters is not to protect them, but to kill Germans. In this desperate battle of attrition, American commanders know that losses can no longer be a consideration. They will pay any price necessary to win. even if it means sacrificing their precious bombers. Looking down at those damaged planes, it's tough to tell how successful we've been. 
or if we've even been successful at all. I don't even want to think about the men inside. God, I hope that's not going to be us when we land. I can't believe we made it back. It's such an intense rush of relief. But the feeling wears off pretty quickly when I ask about Griffith's plane. No one knows anything. No one is sure what happened. But if a plane doesn't return within a couple hours, you know it's never gonna return. I can't imagine what the Griffith family might be doing right now. Thousands of miles away, they have no idea that their son may be dead or dying right now. What will his parents do when the telegram comes saying he's missing in action? God, what would anyone say to my own family if they got the news that I was missing? The waiting, the not knowing whether you're alive or dead. I think it has to be better to be told your son has just died. And that's it. The United States Air Force had just completed the greatest aerial daylight operation of the war. A bulletin on the operations, received within the hour, says heavy bombers of the 8th Air Force. Much depends, of course, on how well the Germans can continue to stand up against the line air attacks. We have been described as a nation of weaklings, playboys, who would hire British soldiers or Russian soldiers, or Chinese soldiers, to do our fighting for us. Let them repeat that now. Also very big news at the moment is the American daylight bombing of Berlin. First, let's meet Colonel Thorpe and some of his men, for they were the first there. All set, Colonel. Go ahead. It was my pleasure to have led the first heavy American bombardment mission over Berlin. It was also my pleasure to have had in our group the first American flag to fly over Berlin. Well, Lieutenant Brown was the pilot on the lead ship for that day. Brown, how about a few words from you? Well, Colonel, I'm glad we were alone on that one, but I don't care about going on too many more like <laughs> Uh, Lieutenant Durr, the navigator who led the mission into Germany that day. Durr, how about some words from you? Well, as you know, it was uh, tough navigating because of the almost impossible weather we had. However, I'm glad now that you elected to go on in, and uh, I'm proud that our outfit could be the first one to make the trip. Good. Uh, Lieutenant Flagler, our bombardier up in the nose. Well, Colonel, the fighters made it pretty hot and the weather made it pretty cold, but I believe we hit the target. Good. Well, man, now that we've been the first ones to Berlin, how would you like to go back again? Well, they and most of the hundreds of crews came home safely, though over 60 didn't return from that first American daylight attack. But undoubtedly, the toughest time was had by Berlin. Berlin now found itself being rocked and shattered by day. Still, photographs taken over the capital of the Reich tell their own story. It's a story that must have spread through the length and breadth of Germany. The first film of the Americans over Berlin. And since then, they've been again. And no doubt they'll go again and again, not forgetting the RAF, 
until, as an effective industrial and administrative center, Berlin is no more. The barracks are empty. So many men are just gone. I barely even had time to learn their names. For John Gibbons and the men of the 100th, their Berlin raids are some of the costliest in bombardment group history. But they also mark the beginning of the end in the battle to defeat the Luftwaffe. Looking around at the guys' faces, there's sadness everywhere. But there's also a sort of grim determination. What we've gone through, it changes you. I know now that I can manage my crew and face whatever I meet in the skies. I'm part of the bloody hundredth now. Dear Minnie Ruth, you will be very pleased to read these lines since they concern your splendid husband, Lieutenant J.A. Cardi. He is such a swell guy, and you have one fine Catholic husband, sis. He is in and out of here regularly, spent the afternoon in here today, which is not the first and will not be the last. Good as gold, he is at daily mass to say nothing of a couple masses on Sunday. Above all, he travels with a good Catholic bunch of men, and then he gets to Holy Communion before taking off on each operational mission over the target. God bless you. Pray for him and his chaplain that we may come out of this even better men in God's eyes. This letter reaches Minnie Ruth back in Houston, Texas, where she's doing her part for the war effort, selling war bonds at Hughes Tools Hardware Store.
party grew quite fond of the hard luck during the first several missions, but it was time for his pilot, Randall Chadwick, to have a plane of his own. The plane, originally known as Buffalo Gal, was now inherited by Chadwick's crew. At last, Lieutenant Cardi and the crew had their own B-17 to call their own. Welcome aboard the Randy Lou.
It's gotten to be a joke. Each time they wake us up in the night for a mission, someone calls out, it's D-Day, but it never is. B-17 co-pilot Burt Stiles and his bomber crew are roused after getting only 30 minutes of sleep. A chaplain is conducting a special service. Something's up. The officers are all in their pressed uniforms. I get the feeling that we're close to big things. Our base commanding officer says, this is it, this is invasion. You're flying in support of ground troops. And just like that, all our wariness evaporates. whether the flight would be scrubbed, but not today. Nothing can interfere with today. We're all suited up and ready to go, but the damn mist is so thick we can't even see the end of the runway. On the morning of June 6th, 1944, Styles and the entire 8th Air Force are among 11,000 Allied aircraft sent to pummel strategic targets on and behind the invasion beaches. It's a trucking job, pure and simple. But there's nothing simple about it. Plenty can go wrong. The breath is tense in my throat. Everyone around me is trying to wisecrack and not give a damn. But nobody's very funny. And everybody gives very much a big damn. We're up here cut off from the whole thing by a layer of clouds. All I can see are a few ships shooting like mad at something. But the mist is closing in again. Above the English Channel, Bert Stiles strains to survey the scenes on the beaches below. There's not a speck of flak. I guess all the flak guns are leveled, waiting for our guys on the ground. June 6, 1944, a quarter of a million men packed inside 5,000 ships fill the English Channel. It is the greatest amphibious force ever assembled, the opening thrust in the battle to topple Hitler's fortress Europe. But as the Allied troops close in on the Normandy landing beaches, they have no idea that their fate rests on the outcome of a war fought 25,000 feet above the Earth. For more than a year, the American 8th Air Force has been locked in a vicious struggle to destroy the vaunted German Luftwaffe and ensure that hundreds, if not thousands, of enemy planes cannot attack and devastate the fleet on D-Day. of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Bring a 
about the destruction of the German war machine. The elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe. And security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. of an American air operation. One small campaign in the greatest aerial offensive of this war. In a sense, it is more than the story of a military operation. These planes, high in the skies over Germany, were a symbol of the unshakable unity of the Allies in their determination to fight together until victory and peace had been achieved. June 21st, 1944. 300 liberators bombed the Focke-Wulf 190 engine factory at Bosdorf, Germany. An hour later, 800 flying fortresses attacked targets at Berlin, Germany. Damage was inflicted on railway stations, freight yards and factories. Bombs were also dropped on the ministries of war and propaganda, as well as Gestapo headquarters. synthetic oil plants and refineries at Ruland, 70 miles east of Leipzig, Germany. Over all these targets, flak was intense and accurate. Interception strong and determined. Return to their bases. All the doors open. Miles away. Miles away. None of these planes returned to their bases on this day. This was not a coincidence, and these planes were not lost in action. This had been decided six months before, on December 7, 1943, when at Tehran, the leaders of the three major Allied powers 
had declared their complete agreement as to the scope and timing of operations from the east, west, and south. Operations from the east, west, and south. Operations on land, on sea, and in the air. The USSR agrees to furnish bases in Russia for the use of the U.S. strategical air forces in Europe, such bases to be used for shuttle bombing operations. Operation Titanic. Shuttle bombing. With American air bases in Russia, our bombers based in England and Italy could attack objectives in Central Europe, the Balkans, or Eastern Germany, land in Russia, refuel, reload, and bomb additional enemy targets on their return trips to their home bases. Operation Titanic. A triangular superhighway in the sky. With shuttle bombing, flying distances from England to some extreme points in eastern Germany and Poland, and from Italy to some points in German-occupied Hungary and the Balkans, would be reduced by a third. Reduced flying distance means reduced danger. For while planes on the shuttle route would have already landed, planes making the round-trip run still have to face flak, interception, or engine failure. With shuttle bombing, Germany and the Luftwaffe could never be quite sure where the next Allied air blow was coming from, or going to. With shuttle bombing, the coalition land war, crushing the Wehrmacht on three fronts, would take wings to become coalition air war, and there would be no target in Germany or German-occupied Europe American planes could not seek, find, and destroy. These were the strategic purposes of Operation Titanic. 100 hours. The morning of June 21st. Somewhere in England. Titanic 2. At 0530 hours, the heavily loaded bombers took off into the fog of an English dawn. 24 minutes later, the first group was in the air, heading northeast to the Task Force Assembly Point. At 0800 hours, two by two, the last relay of fighters left the ground. At 0930 hours, flying fortresses and Mustangs made rendezvous high over the German coast, and Titanic II was on its way. At 1200 hours, it dropped its bombs on the Ruland oil fields and continued to its new bases somewhere in Russia. That is why on June 21st, American planes did not return to their bases somewhere in Italy or England. Their mission was still unfinished. In a sense, it had only begun. Fifteen hundred hours. What was left of our target was a good three hours behind us. But we were still in enemy skies and we could see the P-51s that were escorting us all the way in, prowling in the skies above. They called us Big Friend. We called them Little Friend. And it was a very pleasant feeling to have them around. About 1,600 hours, we saw our red-nosed little friends pull away. A couple of minutes later, our navigator, the little man with the big maps, made with the instruments, and gave us the good word. Navigator to crew. Navigator to crew. It won't be long now. We're over Russia. Over Russia. From the sky, all countries look alike. But this was friendly country. That meant no more flak, no danger of interception. Solid ground not too far away. a new country, a new people, a lies we'd heard about, read about, but never seen. How do you get along with people you can't even talk to? Would we like them? Would they like us?
the task force are General Walsh and General Permanov, the American and Russian COs. Coming in, Base X looked like any other American airfield. Neat rows of GI tents. Runways dotted with B-17s. Ground crews at the edge of the field, their faces to the sky. One difference, though, the ruins all around the base. A silent reminder that enemy boots had marched in two directions here quite recently. each other down, a third of a world away from home. Wheels made in Akron, touch steel matting made in Pittsburgh on an American landing field in Russia. Gower, Messick, Ostrander, Zafak, Malone, Schultz, Badowski, Travers, McGee, Stanley, Rudenstein, Betts. A thousand tourists from 48 states on a short visit between two jobs. Tense moment in international relations. Ivan Ivanovich meets Fearless Fosdick. A handshake says, hello, very glad to see you, in any language. And General Permanov makes it official. I welcome you as fighting allies. Together we'll fight to victory. I wish you the best of luck in combat and a safe return home. After that, there was another important ceremony. Short snorter bills. If we didn't get those signed, the flight would have been illegal. Whenever flyers meet, they talk shop. Even when they can't understand each other. That's when sign language came in handy. And it seemed to work at that. Some Russian wax officers and enlisted women were on the welcoming committee too. It would have been nice to sort of pursue the subject further, but there was work to be done. Some thought they'd teach the Russians another American pastime. and learned that others had taught too well before them. Some tried to bridge the distance home. To let the folks know their wandering boy was somewhere in Russia last night. And some of us, explorers at heart, decided to see Russia. The town near the base is a market center for the adjacent farming district and a fair was held each year along its main street. The factory section. Principal industry, the manufacture of leather goods. The Ukrainian Museum, well known for its collection of historical treasures and valuable objects of art. The grave of the famous Ukrainian writer Karolenko and his home. The population of the town, 130,000 at the last census, has varied in recent years, and there has been a certain decline in the number of children of school age. Those who have remained, or who have returned from the interior, have recently developed a fondness for an American import known as chvachka. Translation, gum. On the way back to the base, a few miles from the town, there's a monument to a Russian victory over an invading army, 200 years ago.
Следующий номер. Украинские народные песни в исполнении хора имени Шевченко. Next number. Ukrainian folk songs by the Shevchenko Choir. The language and the music are strange, but it isn't necessary to understand the language to understand some of the people here. The show marks the beginning of the end of this American visit to Russia. Most of the men are already looking back. Remembering. <laughs> Lieutenant John Morris, navigator of Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, who has the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with four clusters, was particularly impressed by the medals worn by the Russian soldiers. They don't wear ribbons like we do, but the actual medals. Practically every Russian soldier I ran into was loaded with decorations. <laughs> Captain Percy W. Stressing, pilot of Rochester, New York, thought the show explained a lot about the Russian people. Those Russians sure like to sing and dance. One of the numbers was kind of a tap dance. I think the Russians resemble Americans in a lot of ways. They've got a great sense of humor. They can laugh and enjoy everything, even though their whole country is in ruins. Major Samuel Davis, command pilot of Boston, Massachusetts. It was good to relax and listen to music and laugh, but you could never forget there was a war on here. Most everybody was in uniform, men, women, even children. I saw a lot of kids who'd been through plenty of action. Some of them who had medals to prove it couldn't have been more than 10 or 12 years old. One of the other fellows told me he ran into one kid who'd been a sniper with the guerrillas and had 21 notches on his rifle butt. A sniper with the guerrillas at his age. Technical Sergeant Louis Zernick, engineer gunner of Brooklyn, New York, spent a lot of time with the Russian ground crews. Some of them on the show, and quite a few on our base too, had been wounded as much as three or four times. They were working on a base for arrest before going back into combat. Those Russians sure have funny ideas about resting. Staff Sergeant John E. Gagan, tail gunner of Patterson, New Jersey. The show is pretty good. As far as I could see, everybody liked it, including General Aker. He was sitting in the first row with General Perm, uh, Permanov or something like that. The Russian base commander. Lieutenant John McKenzie, bombardier of Paragould, Arkansas. Something I'll remember for a long time were the Russian kids. You got the feeling some of them never had a childhood. They had such old faces. They were pretty shy, most of them, but they seemed to like us. makeup as a rule, but some of them wear lipstick. I remember one girl who was in charge of an ACAC crew. She had 12 enemy planes to her credit. Staff Sergeant Donald Craw, tail gunner of Stratford, Connecticut. The music at the dance was on the corny side, but the girls are nice. I met a girl from Leningrad whose father was a general. She taught me some Russian words, and I taught her some American slang. It didn't take long before I was saying, horror shaw, and she was saying, okay, bud.
Weather? Okay. Take off, 0900 hours. До свидания и счастливый путь. That means good luck. We'll be seeing you. closely united, and they are determined to continue to be united, so that the ideal of lasting peace will become a reality. The weather's fine for flying The fog has gone to bed There's such good visibility You could see victory ahead Let's fill the air with eagles Let's fill the clouds with men And we will see a world that's free When we fly home Again. Said the bombardier to the pilot Well, give us a little ride The pilot said to the navigator Why don't you slide inside The navigator, he looked around and said to the engineer Ah, your hands are dirty, your pants are dirty, you're dirty behind the ear Said the bombardier to the gunner Well, how are we fixed for lead? The pilot said to the radio man How's the weather ahead? Said the bombardier to the pilot Hand us that pretty crate Five degrees to the right will make it Just as sure as fate the ship belonged to the bombardier who opened his little bay. He saw the target, the lovely target, and suddenly... Bombs away! Said the bombardier to the pilot. Call it a day. And then the pilot said to the radio man, Say we done it again. The weather's fine for flying. The fog has gone to bed. Clouds with men, and we will see 
a world that's free when we fly home again. Bomber crews lived a curious war. One day in action, the next on the town. Flak will be heavy, probably accurate. But you've been through worse before. Remember that your biggest enemy is still a single engine fighter plane. in there and stay in there and pitch every minute. This is it, my 35th mission. God, I wonder what Griffith would say if he were here now. Looks like something big is about to happen. The ground crews are hauling out the Tokyo tanks. 
That can only mean one thing. We're in for a real long one. Lights, please. This group of buildings here is your target. This building will be the aiming point. If your bomb pattern is concentrated in this area, it should very effectively knock out the factory. The target was the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt, producing a major part of Germany's needs. We've been up here for hours. And the closer we get to the target, the worse the visibility gets. Bassett and Reed are pitching back and forth on the interphone about the cloud cover and the wind speed. It's always about the damn weather. reach a predetermined landmark called the initial point. Here, Armanini's B-17 makes its final course change and locks in on a straight path to the target. The rest of the bombers fall in behind. Pilot William Veal shifts to autopilot and places control of the B-17 in the hands of Joe Armanini. Hunched over his bomb site, Armanini has just eight minutes to lock in on the target. As the lead bomber, 
every other bomber in the formation will drop on Armanini's queue. If he misses, they all miss. The flak's getting thicker, but we can't deviate from the course. If we're gonna hit the target, we have to hold straight and level and just take whatever the crowds throw at us. Twenty-five thousand feet above Schweinfurt, Germany, Joe is hunched over the bomb site inside the nose of his B-17. Inside the flak field, exploding shrapnel is tearing the bombers to pieces. Now, directly below his bomb site, lies the target they have come so far to destroy. Bombs are away. Nobody even says a word. We hit them dead on, but there's really nothing to celebrate. What's the point? All around us, our bombers are ripped to shreds. It's a pathetic sight. And we need to get the hell out of here. Armanini and the B-17s clear the flak field and set a course to rendezvous with a group of P-47 Thunderbolts. Until they reach their protective fighters, the damaged bombers are at the mercy of the Luftwaffe. Like sharks circling a wounded prey, this is their favorite time to attack. even know what to say. It's almost unbelievable. I made it. I'm still alive. Ending the missions was the biggest deal I've ever had in my life. I was, I was finished, finished with mission. the mission. I was, I was happy. Everybody congratulated, everybody happy for you, and you're happy for yourself. That's about it. You didn't think about anybody else there. You think, you have to be in this world, you have to be selfish. It's a very personal thing. It's something that, hey, you're alive. You're going to back to see your parents. You're going to see your mother and father. You're just thinking selfishly about yourself. No more worry. No more worrying about the, missing the target. No more worrying. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's a, it's a complete re relieve yourself of all these anxiety you had before.
I'm so happy. I mean, I'm thrilled. But at the same time, I'm also kind of numb. Looking around at what's left of the hundredth, it's a damn shame. How the hell can anyone let this happen? And God only knows it's not even close to being over yet. Immediately after completing his missions, Cardi took seven days of leave to visit London and say goodbye to newfound friends. He would soon be leaving England, and a proper send-off was due. As for the remaining crew back on base, they had a few more missions to complete before their 35th, if they were so fortunate. This war had a strange yet familiar pattern of airmen being shot down on their last mission, a fate that was still lurking over the Randy Lou, and Cardi wanted to be nowhere near when it happened. However, when he returned back to Thorpe Abbott on July 28th, all but Fitzroy had completed their missions. Cardi would be there to send him off. Mersburg was known for its murderous flak and fighters and had claimed many before them, and now it was their turn. The skies above Mersburg would turn black and puffy with flak. The leader of the squadron suffered flak damage before the target and jettisoned his bombs. The formation broke up and all aircraft became stragglers. The B-17s were jumped by enemy fighters and the Randy Lou was hit hard. Co-pilot Lieutenant Dykeman called out there was a hole in the gas tank and later a fire in the same spot. The radio man, Carmine Roberto, was killed instantly on the first pass of fighters when a bullet ripped through his jugular. A direct burst blasted the right side near the ball turret. The waste gunner was thrown out of the back door by the ball turret operator, who jumped out immediately after him. The Randy Lou was hit hard. The oxygen was gone, the comms were knocked out, and Sprague ran up to Bushmeyer and told him to bail out. But Bushmeyer seemed to think the plane was flying all right. The plane went into a spin, pinning the airman on the floor. Once below 10,000 feet, the men were able to exit the stricken B-17 and the Randy Lou thundered to the ground. Parachutes dotted the sky above. The Randy Lou crashed outside of Leipzig, Germany. Of the eight who survived the fighters and bailed out of the Randy Lou, Three were reported to have been killed by irate civilians before the military could intervene. Fitzroy was taken prisoner, but not before seeing 12 airmen hung and shot outside of the town. Dykeman, Arnold, and Douglas were among them. Fitzroy, Hartman, Sprague, and Bushmeyer, and O'Donnell were taken prisoner. They were not alone. The 100th lost eight ships as enemy fighters teamed up with the flak. The lead group was hit hard, losing five of the six in the low squadron. Two B-17s that Lieutenant Cardi had flown in, the Black Cat 13 and the Berlin Playboy, were also lost over Merseburg. In all, 15 forts were lost that day. The well-advertised hell over Merseburg was no myth. Joe Cardi sat on the runway and waited for the return of Fitzroy and the Randy Lou. The men counted the planes in the sky, and eight were missing. Cardi knew if the Randy Lou hadn't returned in a couple of hours, it was never coming home. Is Fitzroy dead? Are the men all gone? It must have been a sad, empty feeling. A final conclusion to all this madness. The guilt of surviving.
when so many didn't. I guess I'll be heading home soon. After everything I've been through, that will be a major accomplishment by any account. But there's still so many unanswered questions, so much I'm uncertain of. One thing I am certain of, I have to put the horrors of the past behind me and build a new life, a life of peace, not war. This is the BBC Home Service. We're interrupting programs to make the following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangements between the three great powers, an official announcement will be broadcast by the Prime Minister at three o'clock tomorrow. In view of this fact, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as victory in Europe Day. To those men, this film is gratefully dedicated. Into the 
we come, so we can be our thunder. And 